Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes and welcome to my podcast series where I talk to some of the biggest names in football, as you can see this week. Uh, it's Brendan Rogers, the manager of Leicester City. Brendan, very good to have you here. Hi, Eamon. Nice to see you again. Nice. Let me tell you a bit about Brendan in case uh, you don't know. Brendan's one of the game's most interesting and in-demand uh, coaches. He's now in charge of Leicester City. Uh, like me, Brendan is from Northern Ireland, uh, a place called uh, Carnlock. And Carnlock's a beautiful place because it's on the Antrim coast, Brendan, yeah? Yeah, yeah, very... Just a wee small fishing village, Eamon, you know, but uh, no, great community spirit to there and uh, yeah, lovely part of the world. And, and the thing is, it's a rural community as well that we're talking about. So I often look at you and I think sometimes the achievement, a man like you from the glens of Antrim doing what you do at the level that you have done it in the English and the, the Scottish game, um, does that get you sort of... Um, folklore status back home <laughs> no no well it's normally when you're gone uh, people will judge you won't you but um no hopefully it shows that it doesn't matter whether you're from a big city or a small village uh, like Carnlock that if you have ambition and you have a drive and a determination that you that you can succeed and 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 enjoy what it is you you want to do and that's football has always been my passion and in my life, Eamon, and uh, I knew that ultimately when I was older, I would have to move to England in order to uh, to, to fulfil what I wanted to. But uh, but yeah, but I wouldn't be where, where, I, where I am today in terms of doing what I do without the, the upbringing in Carnot. Well, uh, Martin's, uh, uh, Britain's local team was Ballymena United. Um, he played for them in the Irish League. He uh, went on to Reading. But that professional career, Brendan, was uh, cut short. It was curtailed at the age of 20. What, what was the problem? Why was it so viciously ended at such a young age? No, it was a bit of both, uh, Eamon. It was one where, in, in one of my final years at Reading, I had struggled with with injury uh, we had this sort of genetic problem in our family where it, uh, in our bones it gave us our bones a weakness you know I had a couple of other brothers that suffered with it as well um, but um, but it's also uh, okay I can look at it I've got this injury and I could have probably continued playing but not to the level I wanted to my whole idea when I came over from, from Northern Ireland at 16 was to play at the very highest possible level and I knew that through everything that I was going through that I wouldn't be able to to do that. So you, I made, I suppose, an early choice. Do I continue down the route? I played a bit of non-league football um, and I realised very, very quickly that as, as much as I had a great respect for the guys that were you know, having jobs and then having to play, uh, that that really wasn't why I, I came over, you know, my... my 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 passion was the trying to get to the elite level of the game. So now I wasn't going to be able to do that as a uh, as a player. So could I do it as a coach? And I knew there was going to be a long hard road ahead of me. And I made that decision fairly early that I would uh, I would go down the coaching route. Well, you stayed at Reading. You worked as a youth coach there uh, before being mm -hmm. taken to Chelsea to run their academy by Jose Mourinho. Is that? Tell me about the Mourinho influence, and do you and he uh, remain close to this day? Well, firstly, I, I, had, I had 10 very good years at Reading, progressing my way through, aiming up through the ranks of a young coach to eventually be academy director. Um, but my ambition was always to be renowned as one of the best youth coaches around. And I felt that the next step for me was to do that at I suppose, an elite club. And at that time in 2004, um, Chelsea were starting in that path that, in terms of being a, a sort of sustainable, really consistent top level team throughout Europe. So uh, so Jose had just gone in in the, uh, in the June uh, and I was offered the opportunity. Uh, I knew Steve Clark. Steve was a... Uh, uh, a good guy that was at that time uh, taking the youth team at uh, at, uh, at Chelsea. He was then moved up to uh, um, he was moved up to uh, to work with Josie in the first team, and then they were looking for someone to come in. So a combination of of Steve, 
putting uh, my name forward and the academy uh, manager who's still there now who was who became a close friend of mine was was neil bath and uh, and uh, that combination got me in the door to to speak to to Josie, and then from there we 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 hit it off. Um, and I had uh, what just over four absolutely brilliant years of learning for me as a uh, as a young coach. And I wonder, do I see that, my friend, in your style of football throughout your various clubs? Where correct me if I'm wrong, it's about possession. It's about pressing then with that uh, possession. Um, Jose, big man into his possession. Well, I think at that time, he, he, uh, Jose was a breath of fresh air when he came in to, uh, to, to Chelsea. He really was. In that period I was there, I learned so much from him. Just everything from the, the minute I joined, he was very, very supportive of me. I mean, you know, he, he, was, he wanted to communicate, he wanted to share ideas. Uh, he had a wonderful charisma, and uh, but but he was also a winner. Uh, and I think at that time, that early early part, you know, his team could do everything. You know, they 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 were fast, they were dynamic, they could defend, and uh, he moulded them together in that way. So I suppose my my style is very much. I like my teams to take the game with the scruff of the neck. I like them to get out, to get the ball, create opportunities, be really hard to beat. You know, play in a mixture of of style or not styles, but systems as such. Um, but but at that stage, early on in my career, I had a real close up view of of an elite manager uh, who who also took the time uh, to invest in me as a as a young coach. And uh, like I said, I was in pole position there to learn, and uh, it was a great uh, great time. Not just with not just with Josie, with the, with the players. You know, the first team players were absolutely, you know, a lot of world-class players in there. So I could see firsthand how they operated. But then also my, my young team, my, my youth teams and my reserves, uh, they were top-class young players as well. So that nurturing process of taking them through into the first team squad, I really enjoyed. And, so, and, and Chelsea, Chelsea, I mean, as a, as a club, not only developed players, but what they were great at, and, and you see it through the decades now, they... Um, they, they they really helped develop staff as well. And you'll find not just players developing at Chelsea, but there's a lot of staff that come out of there uh, haven't been nurtured very well. Um, it's one thing I pick up about you. It's a big thing I pick up about you. Um, you're, you're, the players like you. There's a, there's a man management style about you. They like training with you. You're inventive. You're energetic with, with the training. And, I, and I, I just wonder, in terms of that man management, Brendan, how it tests you now during lockdown because lockdown has its problems uh it, it presents different scenarios different people deal with it in in different ways um and you've got to lead and you've got to nurture and you've got to motivate these players and you've got to i suppose also put an arm around them how, how is the team coping with lockdown well they're doing very well in, in terms of the the you know, the medical and the sports science staff have got a great team here that provide them with work you know over a day-to-day -day basis so there's this constant engagement um with the players the, the players are really honest group you know they want to work they know the importance of of taking over um not just for the professional game but for their health as well but they're they've been given real specific individual programs to do whilst they've been off and obviously we've had some players that have been able to go into the club on an individual basis uh, and do work that's been assigned to them. So, um, but yeah, you're just finding ways to 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 engage, to communicate. Um, like I said, we're a very close group of players uh, and staff. Uh, our spirit is, is very strong. So it's just what probably everyone is doing. You're connecting through the WhatsApp, you're, you're having discussions uh, like this here with uh, we have a leadership group at the at the club which, which is a mixture of senior players and younger players so we would talk through that uh, but just that message you know it's only a simple few lines and a few words and uh, so so just trying to engage that way Brendan, it's it's an awful situation it's an unprecedented situation um and and, and football 
is is your life and it's it's the life of those players and whatever but it's not about life it's not about losing life and that just brings me to the whole point of you know when when the game should return and there's a feeling ahead i know there's a big uh, club meeting um this weekend but um uh, there seems to be a feeling that some clubs feel they're being pushed into a return to action. I mean, are you feeling the pressure from that? Or do you think, not my job, not my scenario, I've just got to have these players ready when someone presses the, the green button? Yeah, it's exactly that. I think that the whole when we come back is totally out of our hands, aiming you know, that you're going to government level. Uh, and I think that I think the concept that everyone wants uh, to have is that we all return, you know, the players need to know that the safety is, is there for, for them, for their families, um, for the supporters and everyone involved. That That is the, the crux of it. You know, it needs to be safe to go back into our work and play. Now, we all know how, how big football is uh, over the cross of, of, of the United Kingdom and how how important it is, but there's nothing more important than the safety of people. You see the number of deaths and, that we've had uh, throughout the world with this virus. Uh, so safety is of paramount importance. And as much as we want football, everyone needs to know that we go back into a safe environment. When that will be, we don't know. So I think government are trying to put in place all the measures. Uh, I know that there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to, to, to try and, uh, you know, get it moving in the right direction. But when that time will be, um, we will just have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about, I mean, various leagues, there's so many permutations to all of this, but look, take the Bundesliga. They're, they're looking in Germany to return. And one of the proposals seems to be that if the players get out there on a pitch, uh, maybe behind closed doors, they would wear masks. Is that, I mean, as a coach and as, as a former player, do you think that's feasible? Well, I suppose the question you would ask, should you be out there in the first place, I suppose? Um, yeah, I think it's one that it, it's taken all precautions, really, um, in order to get back playing. Uh, whether that's something that uh, is feasible or not, I, I'm not I'm not sure. But, um, but no, Germany, looking at it and... and the news and everything else on telly from from watching they look as if they're they're a little bit ahead of us in terms of uh when it struck and, and how efficient they were in dealing with it so um but it's very difficult i think to compare countries you know each country is yeah. different on and and, and and how this virus has hit them so i think we just need to look of course ourselves and, and then see how we can progress it out what's your instinct though i mean belgian and dutch leagues cancelled uh French league uh, being voided uh, as well. What's your instinct, say, re the English Premier League, uh, completed or voided? Well, I think we have to give it every chance. I think that's that's what's key. And I think that is what the uh, the Premier League, along with the government, are looking to do. I think it's given that every, every opportunity, because it's not just for the football, it's for the mood of the nation as well, I think. Everyone understands what it can bring from that aspect. So um, they're not jumping into any uh, final decision now, but they're going to give it that bit of time. Um, from a football perspective, of course, we want to be able to uh, you know, to finish off, you know, the, the 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 season, of course. And I think everyone would want that. But like I say, it's all it all has to be done in a safe environment uh, where there's where there's no risk. Um, if someone had said to you, though, at the start of the season, uh, you can have third place, would you have bitten their hand off? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Eamon, we were we were one of the clubs that was um, that was talked about with the possibility of breaking into the uh, the top six, but uh, that in itself was always going to be a really, really difficult challenge. But the players are where they are on merit. You know, they've they, they've worked so hard taken on board what we've tried to bring into the, the club over the last you know, year or so. Uh, they've been consistent in the mentality and the training. And obviously they, they've they produced some 
wonderful performances and, and results. So, uh, so, yeah, 29 games gone and they, they sit there on merit. And, of course, we wanted to be able to, to finish the job. But, you know, we'll see if we can do that. Yeah. Sitting there in merit, absolutely no doubt. It is a great job you and they have done. And, you know, at the at the start of the season, there was this whole big thing. What would we do without Harry Maguire? You know, could Harry Maguire go to Manchester United? Manchester United eventually get him at 80 million quid. Absolutely amazing player for us. We are thrilled to bits with this guy. But it's as if you look at your defensive record and it's as look as if you don't miss this guy. How do you not miss him? Well, firstly, just on Harry, I'd, I'd worked with Harry from the period I came in in February through to the end of the season. Um, and he was an absolute joy, Eamon, I have to say. A good guy who clearly wanted to make what he felt was the next step and go to a super club like Manchester United. But his behaviour never wavered. You know, and the whole time leading up to the summer, he, he was fantastic, wanting to learn, wanting to be better. And then over the course of the summer, when there was all the speculation around him leaving, he didn't waver at all. He was just very focused, re very respectful of his, his teammates at Leicester City. And then eventually he, he got his move. So he was always going to go to Manchester United and be that leader. And uh, no, I'm really happy for him on a personal level, how well he's, how well he's done. Uh, from our perspective, we when we come in, we had we had Cags, who um, who was fourth choice uh, centre half. You had Johnny and Johnny Evans and and Harry playing together. Wes Morgan in behind that. So Cags was a young player that had been brought in, but wasn't really featuring. But I played him in one game uh, away at Huddersfield. He, he'd done really well in training. Johnny Evans was was uh, injured uh, in the morning of a game away at Huddersfield. So we played uh, Kagler in that game, and he showed in that 90 minutes that uh, he was one that, with development, with improvement, that he could uh, he could play in the team. And uh, he virtually never featured then for the rest of the season, but you could see in training, you know, his his, his mental strength, his bravery, you know, he's physically imposing, he's quick, you know, he's got good agility for a defender, and uh, he's very focused. And we felt that. You know, let's see how he does in pre-season, um, and and if he looks okay, then we'll we'll give him an opportunity. And and he did that the final game, a pre-season game against Atalanta. He was very very good. So we decided to start with him, and he's been a revelation. And uh, yeah, he's only going to get better and better. Could I ask you what Johnny Evans brought to your side? A lot of people may have looked at that transfer, and they may have deemed right. Johnny Evans is leaving Manchester United. It's downhill here for him. He's coming to the end of his career. This guy was reborn, rediscovered, re-energized. Tell me, what, what did he bring to your squad? Um, I think, Eamon, for me, where I was at an advantage, I, I'd known Johnny as a young player. I, obviously, from back home, seen, seen him move across to Manchester United. Uh, you know, with with his family, um, you can tell he, you know, Johnny's been brought up well with, with his mum and dad. You know, really solid family, um, and and done fantastic at Manchester United. He, unfortunately for Johnny, when he was there, when Lou Van Gaal was, it, it's a number of injuries, which meant then that he was able to he, he left and obviously went to West Brom. Uh, and then you you seen a player there with his leadership qualities, you know, and, and defending and obviously uh, how he worked there, he done great. But I have to say, Leicester City got the, you know, the, the deal of a century, you know, for three point five million pound to bring in a player of that level. And uh, I suppose when when I came in, I had an understanding that he was a good player. I seen his first one of his first games for Manchester United down at Chelsea, at Stamford Bridge, where he was up against Didier Drogba, and he was. Absolutely immense that day. I think he was around about 19. And I thought, God, he can be a player. So I was then lucky enough to come in and inherit him. He was already at the club. And because of how we wanted to play, you know, the, the, the game that we wanted to play was that of a, you know, to play like a big team, which is to to be really aggressive when you have the ball and, and have open up the pitch and not be frightened of the space. 
he it suited him down to the ground. So for me, since since I've come in, he's been absolutely brilliant. His experience, leadership, his reading of the game, professionalism, what he's done to help Cags. He's like an on-field coach for him. He pulls him around, gets him into position. And just his, he's a really inspirational figure for our squad because he's been up at the highest level uh, and then is in now helping this young squad along with other players like Casper Schmeichel and Wes and Christian Fuchs, Mark Albright, all these guys got real good experience, Jimmy Vardy. These guys, like Johnny, are really helping our younger players. But Johnny's been, he's been absolutely immense for me. Tell me about that that mix. Um, you're talking about the younger players there and the length of time you've been there and this squad that you've got, who, which have been you know similar for 18 months or so. What pressure does that put on you? I mean, you're talking about um, being at the heights. I mean, Leicester and I getting used to being at the uh, at the, the lofty heights um, as well. How do you keep them there? That must involve you going into the transfer market. And I say that because a lot of people would say that it still must be hard for Leicester to hold on to key players. I mean, there's there's hardly a week goes by and you look at the sport pages of the newspapers and there is uh, rumours around, you know, like Madison or Nadidi or whatever. How, how do you balance both? What is your ambition for Leicester and will you be dipping into the transfer market soon? I think firstly, I mean, the, the ambition is always to be as competitive as we can at, at the top level. I think there's obviously a realistic expectation around, you know, the, the top six and the finances that they would have in relation to, to to the rest and a number of the other teams in the league. But, yeah, but that shouldn't stop us wanting to compete and, and, and try to find a different way to, to, to be there. And, of course, listen, I, I'm experienced now where you understand – even the biggest clubs in the world can lose their players. So, uh, of course, you want to create an environment uh, to develop players, make them better. But, of course, there's going to be moments where players will feel like Harry that they need to go to the the the, the next club. And, and obviously for him, that was so one of the biggest clubs in the world. If, but if they do go to the next club, they're going to go at the same price tag as Harry Maguire went to as well, which has got to be advantageous to, to you guys at, at Leicester. I mean, you're not giving them away, are you? No, no. I, I think that the the, the the structure at the club is, is very, very good in terms of you bring in a young talent. So when Harry left, Cags then come in. Uh, so you have that succession plan that, uh, that if you're going to lose one, you're planning forward. And you're thinking that if, you're going to, if one moves, then you've got another one to come in. Or even better, you have a young player coming up from your your youth system. You know, if you look at the the team, the number, the number of the young players that have been in there. So Ben Chilwell's come through the system. Uh, Harvey Barnes come through the system. Hamza Chowdhury come through the system. Uh, and there'll be others to follow. So, you know, I think the first look always has to be on the inside of your club because you might have a 20, 30 million pound player in there. Uh, and if it's not the case, then of course you may have to, to look out. In terms of transfers, Eamon, it's something that we're tentatively looking at. You know, the market, I feel, is going to be very, very difficult this uh, this year, uh, this coming summer. But uh, so it's one where we have discussions, but, um, but there's certainly nothing concrete at this stage. So you got your first job as a manager at Watford, 2008. Mm -hmm. And that actually sort of shocked me because I thought, this guy's only been doing this for 12 years. Um, mm. and, and it's as if you've been around forever. And I mean, you're a young manager, but you're an incredibly experienced guy. And so that whole idea that um, when you went into coaching at, at, uh, at 20 uh, and, and you, you stay at Red and you go in to do that youth coaching. So then you get a job at Watford in 2008. Uh, you then go back to to Reddit again after that. In 2010, that's when the Swansea uh, journey um, started, uh, getting them into the, the the Premier League, and then and then came Liverpool, and and three years there uh, before um, Celtic. You've done a lot, mate, haven't you? In a short space of time. Yeah, I suppose I, I left school, uh, Eamon, without any qualifications. 
you know, not I love school. You know, I went to St. Pat's College in Ballymena. Absolutely loved it. Never missed a day. I was never skipping school. But at that time, whenever GCSEs was coming in for me, my life was football. So I left school without any qualifications. But my life has been built on experiences. And that's what I've always felt that, you know, I, I go into, I take on jobs because of the challenge, uh, never to try and be comfortable. And uh, and I've mostly been in jobs for maybe two, three years. Uh, and either I've been relieved of my duties or uh, or I, I look for the, the next challenge. So, yeah, I, I've... I've been thankful for all the clubs that I've that, that, I, that I've worked at. Watford for giving me an opportunity, first and foremost, to be a manager. Back then, when I was coaching, I had no real desire to be a manager. When I started, I wanted to be the best coach I could, helping players improve and develop. And then gradually, of course, when you work through at Chelsea to some of the biggest players in the world, they realise that you've had 15 years as a coach. Now is maybe the, the chance to step in and do it under real, real pressure. So, um, and I've absolutely enjoyed every minute of it. You know, there's been highs and lows, of course, but that's but that's the game. And uh, yeah, so um, so yeah, my, my ambition has been to get to a thousand games as a manager. I'm now on, I think, about five hundred and thirty-three or something like that. So, uh, so I've got hopefully many more to come. Many more to come. Uh, you took Liverpool to within two points of that Premier League title and now under Jurgen Klopp, they're now 20-odd points uh, ahead. Mm. Would it be an injustice if the season was voided without them winning the title? Or what do you see the permutations there? I mean, how would you? How do you look at that Liverpool situation and how it could possibly end? Well, I think if you're a Liverpool supporter or player or staff member, you, you, you'd hope that the, the season could be finished. There's absolutely no doubt. I mean, they're deserving of it this season. You know, they've, they've clearly been consistently the best team, with the level that they've been playing at, the quality. Um, that They've just been absolutely fantastic. So, uh, so yeah, it'd be an absolute shame if they don't get the chance to, to lift the title, you know, because the... Uh, you know, they've been waiting so so long for about thirty odd years. So, uh, and they're deserving of it. They've been they've been the best team. So, um, so yeah. So, but um, but Jurgen and, and and the people at Liverpool will obviously be like everyone, hoping that uh, we can get back playing, but obviously back into a safe environment. You look at Jurgen and um, what he's done at Liverpool. Is it? substantially different from what you were doing or what you were trying to do? I mean, what I'm getting at is, do I detect a similarity in the way you guys approach your football? I think that, listen, Jürgen's an offensive coach. He, um, I think he's done absolutely brilliant since he's been in. You know, I think the those first couple of years about finding out about the team and the players and the club, and I think he's led it absolutely brilliant. Um, when I was there, it was different times. I mean, you know, we were eighth in the uh, in the Premier League, and uh, the, the team or the club was having to, yeah, you know, because they weren't in the Champions League, they were having to cut the budget, and we were getting players in on loan and, and bits and pieces like that. So, so for us to 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 do what we did and uh, it was going to be difficult to sustain that, but, but we had a, a great opportunity in my second year and just just fell short. But um, I think Jurgen then came in and uh, was able to to build on that. Hopefully, come into a good base, and over those first couple of years, they continued to improve. And then the big step was getting in the, the top class players. You know, there, there was a real uh, synergy there between the the board and the manager. And that allowed them to then go and get uh, Virgil van Dijk, who's been immense, obviously the goalkeeper, and uh, and one or two others. And then that level of player then has taken the team to uh, to, to a really really high level. But Jurgen's managed them brilliantly, you know, led the led the club uh, so well. And then, like I say, they're only within a, a few games of of getting the title. So there's absolutely no doubt they deserve it. Supporters deserve it because they've been waiting for a long time. And uh, like I said, they'll be hoping that we can get back to playing and they get the first title. 
Yeah. And there's no part of you that, that thinks, I mean, you're only human. Um, it could have been me. If I had have said, if things had worked out differently, I could have done that. Well, at that time, listen, we, we, were, we were on this amazing run that first couple of years, the first six months when I went to Liverpool, where it was, you know, implementing our style and our way of working. And then we went on, uh, once we signed Philippe Coutinho and Daniel Sturridge in January of um, 2013, then we went on this amazing run for about 18 months where the level of our football and game was at a really high level. So, um, yeah, so second year, you look at it, we went so close, but I always think the Premier League, the, the best team will win it over the, the 38 games. We just didn't manage to, to do it um, with a young and experienced team at that time. And maybe if we were to stay together, you know, we kept Lou that summer. Uh, we didn't need too many additions, really. We could have uh, then taken the next step the, the following season, but we weren't able to do that. We, we lost a, a real charismatic player for the team. Uh, and then we just sort of dwindled away. Yeah. There are those who would who would mock and take joy and talk about, you know, that Stevie Gerrard slip and, and all that sort of thing. I mean, I'm only saying there are those who would. I'm not saying I would. I'm just saying there are those who would. <laughs> Do you... <laughs> Do you and, and Stevie G and the, and the fact that, you know, you were in Glasgow and you were at Celtic and then he comes to Rangers, is it ever mentioned or do you never, I mean, can you ever look back and smile, laugh, say what if, or is it just never mentioned? Don't mention the war. No, I think it's it's one where Stevie was, was a great captain for me when I went there. Uh, Eamon, you know, he gave everything to, to the team and to the cause and in terms of support and what I was doing as a, as a young manager in there, so uh, and, and for and his performance level over those first couple of years in particular, you know that, that put us to that level. You know he was, you know, absolutely magnificent for me, and and we wouldn't have been in the position. It was just one of those really really unfortunate uh, moments that um, you know you just never seen happening. Now, we were dominating the game, you know, in that in that first game, but. Um, but yeah, it just wasn't to be. And of course, you have moments where you think back over the course of not just that, but of course the season, you think we were so close uh, and it would have been brilliant for us to, to have done it, you know, but uh, but it wasn't to be. So um, you just have to, uh, you know, you just have to move on. And, and, and it was just one of those unfortunate circumstances. Tragic. Um, now, um, then, then Celtic, <laughs> Celtic happened, right? right. Then, <laughs> then Celtic happened, right? Yeah. Now, I want to, I want to just say how important. I mean, there are clubs and there are clubs, and you know, when you are a kid and you are a supporter and your community is a supporter and what, whatever, what was it like? And, and and especially back home for people to say, "What, well, Brendan? You've got the Celtic job." What, what was that like? Yeah, it was it was just absolutely incredible, Eamon, You know, it went back to um, it went back to uh, it was around. But it was when Celtic were playing. Uh, I was out of work at the time. I was travelling around, but I, I never forget it. There was once uh, Sunday I was up in up in Belfast, and uh, I was at a christening, and it was the it was the it was the day that Celtic were playing uh, Rangers in the semi final of the, the Scottish Cup. And I was in mass at the christening, and I never forget that every time I would sort of look around, all the all the people that were in the, the chapel were on their phone looking at the scores. And I remember coming out of the uh, of the christening, and then actually seeing everyone sort of deflated that Celtic had uh, Celtic had lost. So, uh, and it was then at that moment I'd seen all the reaction from everyone and. and and what it felt for, for Celtic to lose. So um, so then forward on, I was given the chance then to uh, uh, to go into Celtic. I didn't tell many people at all uh, that I was even in talks because I knew the level of how excited they would be. Uh, they would just go through the roof. Um, but once I'd finally signed, spoke to my brother, and uh, and then just that first day when I, when I turned up at, at Celtic Park, I was the proudest man in the world. I mean, you know, you know yourself, like you say, you grow up back home in the community where it's full of 
Celtic people and Celtic supporters. So to be out there on that day, uh, it was just it was just absolutely amazing. And then you and went. Then, I mean, it was an itch that you scratched. It was a dream fulfilled. I I, I, I totally get it. We could sit and talk about this forever about uh, what that means sort of um, culturally as well then it was back to the Premier League and it was um, Leicester and I want to look we've got the league table here as to as to where you're sitting and just want you to uh, just 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 have a look here and you know Liverpool my goodness me what a lead absolutely incredible um, City they're catchable they're catchable for you um, and then you've got those you know the European places you've got uh, Chelsea uh, Manchester United Look at Wolves. Look at how well Wolves and, and Sheffield United have done there in sixth and seventh uh, places. Let, let me ask you, Brenton, would this awful lockdown, would that come at a good time for certain teams in terms of smaller squads relying on um, a small group of players, being able to regroup, reform, re-energize? Um, what, what's your take just looking there at the top six, top seven? No, my take is it, it, it's clearly a, a disruption. You know, we you're going to be out of playing for a long, long time. I think, of course, everyone would have preferred to have been in rhythm, you know, and, and just to have continued the season. But uh, but no, I think you look at the table there, like you say, we're, we're there a merit. You know, we were four points behind Manchester City and, and looking to looking forward to try and see if we could finish as high as we possibly could. Then, of course, like you say, you have Chelsea and the teams in behind that that, that are pushing uh, to, to try and get into those uh, top four positions as well. Like like you say, Sheffield United, you know, Chris has done an amazing job there. You know, he's shown that you can have a group of players with the right spirit, real good organisation and a real, uh, you know, a real emotional attachment with the supporters. They're, they're a very, very difficult team to play against and they've shown that consistently. Uh, that they really, really deserve to be up there. So, um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of challenges to, to be to, to get into that top four. But, uh, but like I say, it was uh, it was a brilliant season up until the point when it uh, when it finished. So, what what is the priority? As a matter of fact, you were talking about Liverpool. You were talking about Coutinho. I hear he's might be on the market again. Would he be of any interest to you? I don't. Listen, I've seen lots of rumours and speculation even around. Young Phil, I don't think that uh, Philippe's a wonderful player, uh, a brilliant talent, but but he'd be someone that would be a way out of our price bracket, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So what what about the priority? You look there, Champions League must be so important. I mean, if you finish within that uh, that top four, so what what's going to happen? Am I right in saying City City won't qualify for the Champions League? They'll be they'll be barred for next year. So that leaves the top five places does it for Champions League well I'm not sure I think the, the Man City one is still um, yeah, they're still ongoing and all you can do is, is focus on yourself Eamon and get yourself into into that top four as you say there's uh, there's nine games for us to go and and mm -hmm. you know, our hope is that we can get the opportunity all being well to, to finish in, in that top four and for, for Leicester, they, they've qualified once before in the history uh, into the Champions League. And, that, of course, that was that iconic season when they, when they won the league. So, so for us to be able to, to do it for only the second time in that history would have been, a, would have been a, an incredible achievement. So, um, so we hope, the fingers crossed, that we can get back, we can get playing and uh, all been safe and well and we can qualify. Yeah, uh, there may be certain conditions, of course, to that as to when you would start, how long the season would get on. But say, say we kick off again in June. Um, they're now talking about um, home advantage may may not play a part, that uh, teams may lose or some teams may lose their home advantage if the stadium does not come up to um, sanitization standards and whatever as well. So you'd have no supporters. You may not be at home as well. You may be playing at Twickenham. You may be playing at Wembley, whatever. It may not apply to you, but would that matter as much? I mean, that that is pretty artificial circumstances, really. No crowds, um, maybe not playing at your, your own ground. Um, would clubs is it likely clubs would go along with that, or what's your view on that as a coach? 
listen, the view is, of course, it would never be the same without the supporters. You know, the, that's the that's why you play. It's that you know, the two most important uh, groups in, in, in football is the players and the supporters. You know, they, uh, it's not the same without either. You know, so, um, but of course, if, if it was behind closed doors, then we would have to play. We'd have to find the purpose in order to do that. You're then hopeful that supporters at the very worst would be able to watch the games, um, even though they maybe can't be in there. Um, yeah, and, and, and of course, like I said, as a coach and a management team, you, you would have to find a way in order to, to create that, that emotional purpose for the players. Because like I said, it, it is different. You know, lots of players respond off the crowds. You know, they maybe don't train quite the same, but on match day, because of the supporters of the competition, they're, they're, they're there. So if you don't have the supporters, then it's, uh, then of course it, it, it would never be the same. However, if that's what we have to do, then we have to find the way to, uh, to play and to get our end, end result. And do you think it's more important to finish one season rather than worry about starting another season? Yeah, I, I would say that you would that you would want to finish this here, but on the same token, I think the longer it goes on, Eamon, then the more difficult that could become. There's an argument to to say then, well, you know, whichever way, however, which way they would then end up finishing the season then you're looking then towards to the next one, you know, but, uh, but there's so many issues around it, isn't there? You, you, you're seeing it on a daily basis. You, you know, it, it's, well, what's your, what's your gut what, instinct? Do you think, do you think we'll be back or do you think, what, what, what's your gut instinct on this? I really don't know. I really don't know him because it changes, you know, you, you know, from sort of from week to week and day to day at times, you know, you, you, you you know, a number of days back, you're looking at, uh, you know, some of the noises coming out in terms of how everything is is gone from the government level. That it may well, you know, we, we we can get football maybe back on. And then all of a sudden, you see the France situation, what's happened there in French football, where they, you know, look like they, they stop the season. Uh, you hear of more deaths. Um, so, so yeah, so it's. It may well be optimistic to think that we can get back, but um, say it's, it's just something that's so agile, it's changing all the time. And because none of us know, and, and, and of course the silence is, is, is very, very difficult in itself because your emotions change on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether, you know, I think everyone would love to have football, you know, for the players, for people, uh, at least to give, give the nation something as, as well, other than, than lockdown. But then at the same time, if you've got people uh, still dying from this virus, then uh, ultimately the safety of, of socially is, is the most important. And, uh, and like I say, for football players to have that, you know, to have that feeling that they can go and play a game knowing that they're safe, their families are, will be safe. And like I say, everyone socially, that is what is most important. But that, that it's, it's, it's constantly changing. We will change too, as as individuals, maybe even as a society um, as well. At the end of all of this, so many things that are different in in all our lives, and maybe our priorities are are different. And we appreciate our health, and we appreciate the extra time we have. We appreciate families and whatever. But what about the family of football, uh, and, and particularly in Britain? Um, how, how will it change, Brendan? Do you think it will change? Do you think there will be a legacy? I mean, you know, for any of us, you know, even if uh, social distancing um, restrictions are lifted, how many people are going to say, do I really want to stand close to people and, at a football ground or sit close to people? Um, uh, you know, the finance of clubs, how this is going to hit in terms of uh, pay referrals or pay reductions, smaller clubs, all, all that sort of thing. Do you think there will be... A price for football to pay or a change that we will see in in football as a result of all of this yeah i don't think there's any doubt certainly from an economical perspective you know the landscape has changed um you know you would never have considered a number of months back that the impact 
of a virus like this, what it would do to football clubs. Um, so I don't think there's any doubt the planning of clubs going forward will be uh, uh, will be certainly looked at and, and, and managed probably in a different way. I think going forward, it's going to take time. You said about supporters, this is a, you know, it's the national game. It's a really passionate game. It, it's renowned worldwide. You know, the, uh, you know, English football in particular, you know, is the most emotional, you know, competitive uh, game in the world. Um, so people will want to watch it. And I just think it's going to be step by step. You know, I think that we'll get back, hopefully, it'll, it may well take a few years to get back to normality again, is what we would say was normal. Um, but the passion for football will always be there. And uh, and like I say, we'll, we'll in time, uh, I'm sure, get it back to to what we what we all love, which is supporting your team with that passion and that enjoyment whilst being safe. I miss it. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's your job, but I, I, I've realised how important it is in my life from a social point of view, from a relaxation point of view, from a passion point of view, from you know, determining what you talk about during the week. Um, and you realise, gosh, I really, I really miss this. How much are you missing it? Yeah, yeah, I think that, listen, we're, we've been given this gift of time with our families. Uh, so I've tried to enjoy that and maximise that. My frustration in that is I can't see uh, my two older children. You know, I haven't been you know, able to, to be close to them for uh, for a number of months now. So that's frustration. But, um, but I've been trying to use this time as efficiently as I can and enjoy it as much as I can. Yeah. But there's no doubt football's my life. You know, it's not just my work, it's my love, it's my passion. I love being around the players, love being around the staff. And you also miss the pressure. Eamon, you know, you, our, miss, our you actually job. miss the pressure. Yeah, you, you miss it because there's a purpose to, to your work. And that, you know, you go into every game and, and no matter what people tell you, there's never an easy game. The game, as you go into it, there's always that, you know, feeling that if it if it goes wrong, you know. So and so that's something that's in you. That's something that, as a manager and a coach, you, uh, you know, we don't have that now. Um, so um, so you miss all of that, but you mostly miss the relationship we, with the people, the players, and uh, yeah, that's something that the longer you are away from them, of course, the more difficult it becomes. But Brendan, just finally to say goodbye to you, I just want to say your time is not wasted. You're you're on a mission there. I, I, I'm looking at your beautiful home and I've never seen a whiter home. And I am, I'm looking, I'm thinking your fingers must be worked to the bone, keeping that clean, keeping that <laughs> white. That is, I mean, so so that is that is God's work that you're doing there. No, no, listen, I'd love to take the, the accolades for that, Eamon, but what it is, we actually... We were on in the midst of moving, right? We we sold a property down in uh, down in Leicestershire where we were, and uh, we were we were going. To, we bought another house that we were ready to move into, but it needed some work. And then it ended up that we were renting a property, ah. uh, to going in, but that's been unable to to happen. So we haven't moved into our house. So I'm currently in a in a rented property, but thankfully. The, the uh, it's it's a it's a really nice place. So uh, so yeah, it's very it's, white. It's very white, very nice, and um, very, very, very good. Very but yeah, very good talking to you, Brendan Rogers. I hope you're back in business, uh, and 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 all the other football teams back in business um, soon. May you continue to stay safe and well, and we await developments as to what will happen with uh, the rest of uh, the season. But uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, speaking to me. Appreciate Pleasure. it. Good to speak to you again. Thank you very much indeed. Brendan Rogers.